Good evening, everyone. My name is Mark Tribe. I'm the chair of the MFA Fine Arts Department at SVA. And I'd like to welcome you to this evening's talk by Zoe Buckman, a multidisciplinary artist whose sculptures, installations, and photographs explore ideas and issues related to feminism, mortality, and equality. Hmm. Sorry. Not bad, right? Oh, Are you noticing I tweaked the grammar just a little? Thank you so much for that. Um, Fucking English people. They own. just don't talk right. No, no, it wasn't incorrect. I just sort of, you know, reorganized. Like Zoe and I met once several years ago on a panel that was organized by Hank Willis Thomas about art and politics, I think. I was so nervous. So it's sort of like, why are we having a panel on art and politics at an art fair, which is more or less about avoiding politics, mm -hmm. but in any case, mm -hmm. maybe that was why. And you smashed it. Thank you. Thank you. Is that a good thing? Yes. I killed it. Killed it. Um, dead. Zoe has had solo exhibitions at Fort Gansafort Gallery in, here in New York, Gavlak Gallery in Los Angeles, Project for Empty Space in Newark, a space that Jasmine Wahi runs, Papillon Art yes. in Los Angeles, and Garris and Han Gallery in New York. Her work's been included in group shows at the Museum of Art and Design here in New York, the Baltimore Museum of Art, um, where she currently has work up in a reinstallation of their permanent collection that will be up, I think, through 2013, um, which is pretty exciting. So next time you're in Baltimore, be sure to uh, go check out that show. Um, MOCA, Virginia, which is on the campus of Virginia Commonwealth University. Um, the Camden Arts Center in London, Studio Museum in Harlem, the Children's Museum of the Arts in New York, Arsenal Contemporary uh, in an exhibition curated by Jasmine Wahi here in New York. Um, that's an interesting gallery, I think. Yeah. Um, let's see here. Um, Paul Kasman Gallery, Goodman Gallery in Cape Town, South Africa. Not Marion Goodman, but Goodman, which is... Hanks Gallery, Hanks yeah. South African Gallery. Yeah, and, and probably the, you know, the most globally well-established South African gallery, at least in terms of like art fair presence and that kind of thing. Uh, Jack Shaneman Gallery here in New York, Monique Meloche Gallery in Chicago, Grunewald Gallery uh, at Indiana University in Bloomington, Indiana, the National Center for Civil and Human Rights in Atlanta, Georgia, and the National Museum for African American Art, uh, African American History and Culture in Washington, D.C. And also, interestingly, in an exhibition organized by Rock the Vote at the 2016, Zoe received the Art Change Maker Award from the New Jersey Visual Arts Center and the Art and Social Impact Award from Baxter Street here in New York. Her works received support from Art Matters and the Art Production Fund did a billboard on the Sunset Strip in LA, right? Uh, Neil Sculpture. Cool. Um, studied at the ICP, International Center of Photography here in New York. Lives and works in Brooklyn. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to uh -huh. Ms. Zoe Buckman. Hi everyone on Zoom. Hi everyone in the room. Um, everyone on Zoom, I wish you were here, but also it is so hot in here. And it's hopefully, um, I put my jacket on because the sweat patches were so real. And I didn't want to be that. Um, All right, so we'll start. Sweet, thank you. Um, so, hi guys. Um, I don't really know what it is in particular that you're interested um, in hearing from me this evening, if, if anything at all. But um, I thought what I would do is just put together some images that kind of span the, the work that I've been making since I began showing my work formally in, um, in shows. And so here, um, as Mark said, I um, started out in photography. I went to ICP and the reason why I went there is because I thought that I wanted to be an artist and I wanted to be an artist that used photography and video. And it's only now, like many years later, that I've actually, that I'm actually for the first time exploring video. And for the most um, part in my career thus far, I haven't used photography at all. Um, so when I left school, I became a mum and um, 
began to deplete inside my body and I almost had a stillbirth but luckily I didn't um and that is really what started this new body of work new as in like I left school and it was really like my first series since art school and that became uh, oh look there's what I'm saying is whoa look at that that's really chippy hi um so this became my first solo show it was at a gallery which is no longer there it was on the barrier it was called garrison hunt and basically i was looking at time and specifically the fact that everything living dies um it's really fun but i began by photographing these dying flowers and it was important to me that they weren't dried and dead but rather they were in that um that sort of precious moment when something living begins to rot or deplete and at the time I was taking them to my studio and photographing them in these black bin bags and the process of doing that made me realize that I was much more interested with the object um, and I think because the experience of becoming a mom and the fact that it was the first time in my life where I had been in, con in control of any situation where I had actually led um, I Although I almost had a stillbirth, I was super fortunate and I actually had a home birth and I like fucking killed that shit. And I was young, I was a young mom. And because of things that we'll later get into, I um, had never really saw my voice or even my body really. Um, so that was a huge pivotal moment for me. And because of that, I was like, well, I should look at this time of uh, to be a time of exploration. Your internet connection is unstable. Sorry, y'all. Don't think there's anything I can do about that. Um, so I ended up plastinating my placenta at the Institute of Plastination in Germany. I later put it into marble when it came back to me nine months later with this show, which kind of sparked off people's interest in my work. Um, the gallery had this ground floor and it also had this basement. And I mentioned that because uh, they asked me, you know, do you want to take over the basement or do you want to have another artist do that? And again, like Zoe, who wasn't yet like comfortable being Zoe, was like, oh no, get another artist. I don't, I don't have enough work. I don't think I should take over two floors. It's my first solo show in New York. And then I was like, mm, maybe fuck that. So. Sorry, is it okay that I swear? Yeah. Excellent. Um, so I ended up going, all right, I'm going to take over the ground, the basement, but if I'm asking viewers to enter this beautiful gallery and descend these stairs into this dank space, then I need to take it as an opportunity. It sounds really, um, we were in new age, but oh well. I need to take it as an opportunity to go further and deeper and descend into what this work is for me. So I started to look at the subconscious and I wanted to work with the space. It was dark, it was dank, and artists had been painting a warm, dark space, a little bit, I guess, like a womb of sorts, um, and, and create this installation where I, um, I had secretly recorded the last meal that I ever had in the home that I grew up in. My parents sold it. But um, we had kebabs on our last meal and I recorded it. And so that was played in this room along with the sound of the sea. And I found these, um, one of them was a lace table runner. And so some snippets of text from this poem I had written. So the reason why I mention this is because A, I just, I, I think it's really important as women or marginalized people that we take opportunities that are given to us to to take up more space and challenge ourselves to to go further however uncomfortable that makes us but i'm also mentioning it because i'm realizing that the thing that i just completed making now which is 10 years later is very much informed by this installation so again we'll get there um, I was working with glass for that show, concrete for the first time. It was really the most explorative and since that show. I've been honing things more. Not that it made me any money because the one big collector who came in wanted to buy the placenta. And I had to explain to her that it wasn't for sale and they don't like that. Um, so then I, you know, I have this baby and she's a handful. 
pacify her, I would rap to her because <laughs> growing up we all aspired to American rap. And so it just so happened that I, I knew almost all of Biggie and Tupac's lyrics um, by heart. And then when you're in a sleep deprived state in the middle of the night with this crying infant, just it just comes out. <laughs> so I'd be cooing into her ear these lyrics and I'd be like, oh, this is problematic. Like at some point she's gonna be understanding language, God willing, and um, this stuff is very um, heavy. And I was thinking about the, the, polar, the polarized views of women within my favorite genre of music, um, how Tupac really celebrated women, particularly his mother, sometimes his baby mother, but um, how Biggie, who I think is pretty much as skilled a um, writer as Shakespeare and as funny and naughty, his everything that he said about women was just so demeaning. However, I was, I was thinking about a lot of things <laughs> and I personally only make work from things that I find complicated. I don't make work that says, I disagree with this thing, this thing is bad and whatnot. I, said, I don't feel that way about um about hip-hop that the installation is beautiful i think that as artists we can use um either tactile quality or aesthetic quality to to give a layer of celebration to something and so this installation i did um off of um close to crenshaw boulevard in la a papillon um oops that um yeah all, all the pieces there were over 90 pieces of vintage lingerie with biggie and tupac lyrics that referred to women hand embroidered on them and you could walk through it and the pieces kind of moved and danced and the um museum of art and design have currently a installation of about 12 or something pieces um yeah i had fun putting the text on different parts of the body if it referred to legs or walking or whatnot I might embroider it onto um stockings if it was about abortion if it was about uh, make your kidneys shift um I would often play around with the stomach area um this is from um keep your head up by Tupac which is like a pro pro choice <laughs> track um and okay so then I did that show and as I'm sure you guys work as well I for me anyway I'm often really immersed in one thing and once that starts to um figure itself out or um I get to the point where I know where that show is going to be or whatever I'm already thinking about what's next or allowing myself to explore what else I'm trying to say so I've been working with the lingerie. I had a bunch of it in my studio that I, that I never embroidered. And <clears throat> this was a year or so before Trump was elected. And all of this language and rhetoric was surfacing again in the media about um, abortion and rape. And I made this piece. It also had a sound component to it. And it's a, um, it's a, it's a gynecological chair from the turn of the century. Uh, and this was around the time that I started boxing, which was another really important step for me on a personal level, um, doing talks and stuff. And, and like I said, at the beginning to Mark, I was really, really nervous when we did that panel um, at the Armoury. And I, I found speaking really difficult and awkward. And the boxing gym became this space where a, I could connect back to my East London roots and all the toxic masculine, masculinity that I kind of honestly missed. Um, so I grew up with three brothers and a dad and, and it was like just a very bravado culture. And there was something about the boxing gym where I was like, oh yeah, like, I know this. I, I, I know this energy or this fucking testosterone. Yeah. Um, and then I was learning as most people do who have experienced violence when they learn uh, a martial art of some kind, it really um, 
it's super triggering, but it gives you an opportunity to work through things, processing things in the boxing gym. I became obsessed. I was there like four or five times a week. And I was also going through a divorce. And so I felt like I was fighting at home and I'm fighting on the outside, blah, blah, blah. And this, the idea for this piece came to me, I made it on my wall um, in the studio and, and then uh, we turned it into a public sculpture on Sunset Boulevard. This was after Trump was elected. Um, project for Empty Space. Okay, so now I'm, I know I'm still getting divorced when I had this show. Um, I was thinking, to choose my words carefully here. Um, I was thinking a lot about John Keats, the weird p- pivot. But um, when I was in school, like in London school, I really loved literature and language, and it is a thread throughout my work, particularly uh, since this series. And I was thinking about my favorite poem, which is called Ode on Melancholy. And Keats says, it's my favorite because it's short. Um, so it's easy to memorize, but also Keats said this thing and it, at the time when I was a teenager, I thought it was just so beautiful. And he said, um, if thy mistress some rich anger shows in prison her soft hand and let her rave. And I just thought, oh, that's what I want. Like, I want someone to let me rave. Um, and then as I got older and I started to think about the Madonna poor complex and I started to think about experiences I'd had with men, I was like, mm, in prison, her soft hand, like really, he's like, you, you're a master with language and you have chosen to use the word in prison and her in the same sentence, let her reign, really, like, like what she will reign, you know? And so I, but because I just think that this poem and and these, there are some really beautiful ideas in that. I wanted to make some work that was about patriarchal constructs that keep us hemmed in, held back, um, or adhere us to these ideas of chastity and purity. And I chose to use wedding dresses to make these clusters. And that is all I am allowed to say on that. Um, that's in the honor says, let her read. That was in the show. Um, <clears throat> pardon me, I expanded the work I made quilts. I don't know if I'll do that again, honestly. Um, I made this neon that was in a ring that said in prison her soft hand. Um, it was in LA. That was actually New Jersey. These, yeah, the, this was the first time that I was working with um, these clusters of boxing gloves, which I still am, honestly, still exploring this. And I, I feel like I'm only just hitting my stride with it now. Um, but I loved how talking about these things, again, chastity, purity, perfection, all of this like bullshit stuff that women are held to. Um, I, I wanted to make these pieces that were almost sort of stressful and a bit ridiculous. Um, all the textiles that I use, I always, um, use worn vintage. They have stains sometimes they have burns sometimes they have tears and i find that stuff obviously really interesting so i would cut them up and i'd pin them together and then i would take them off to this wedding dress maker and she would finish them for me and that was a very deliberate decision because with the lingerie i do my hand embroidery myself right and it's fucking mess and that's okay it's you can see when you look at these pieces you can see my toil and my time. You can see my mistakes. If you look at the back of them on the inside of them, it's like, I don't know, it's like some kind of spaghetti junction. Um, but I wanted these to be annoyingly perfect. And I don't I don't have that skill. I don't even use a, um, a sewing machine, actually. I don't do it by hand. And wedding dress makers, all they care about is perfection. So it was kind of perfect, I want a fair word. Then everything got real realistic. Um, yeah, what to say? Basically, my mother was terminally ill, and I was thinking a lot about the home. I was thinking a lot about the violence that she experienced in the home. And whilst my mother was sick, not by the way in in my home, as in in her upbringing. Um, and while my mum was sick, I myself was in a relationship where I was experiencing um, physically, emotionally, spiritually um, 
my power being taken away from me. Um, I was not safe, but because I was going through this thing with my mum, who was my best friend, I wasn't in a place to really address that, and it came out of my work. Um, so I began to collect these used uh, tea towels and at this point and, and create these sculptural works that was at a gallery in Chelsea um, and then at this point this was another big turning point how am I doing for time? Okay, I'm doing all right. Excellent. Um, is everyone on Zoom all right? You're right Zoomers, you're all right. Ellen Carpenter um, yeah, just calling you out because you're going to screen up. So I just want to make sure you are here, Ellen. Are you here? Um, I'm kidding. Hi, Ellen. Hi. Hi. I am so sweaty. Um, so at the time, I was asked by the New York Times to. Oh my, I'm going to cover up the text that I'm here of what I'm saying. That's so fucking weird. Um, so I was. <laughs> I was asked by the New York Times to write something, a 300 word essay on my experience of 2018. The reason they came for me, obviously, um, I knew was because it was the year of Me Too. And they were like, oh, we should probably get a woman, uh, probably a woman who makes work about violence. And there's like three of them. Um, <clears throat> I'm joking, there's many more. Um, and so I, I, I wrote something. And I decided, oh, oh, big point. They said to me, it can be as abstract as you'd like. Sick. 300 words as abstract as I like. Boom. So <clears throat> I like poetry. I like to write poetry. Um, I don't know if it's particularly good. But I decided that I would weave together this text where I was putting down little snippets of things, um, things that men had said to me, things that I had said to men. Um, things that men had said to other women in my life that they had shared with me, other, other women and non-binary people, actually. Um, so it started off with, I told him I could get blood out of anything. Ha, women have been getting blood out of fabric since time immemorial. And then it went on to, like, other weird shit, and some stuff was about BDSM, blah, blah, blah. And I was really proud of it. And in it was this piece of text. You see, Mama would use that cloth to cook and clean. And then when she had a black eye, she would fill it with ice and use it to stop the bruising. And then it was like bruising, pinching, covering mouth and breastplate. I'm like, this, this is good shit. New York Times, you're welcome. And I sent it to them. And they were like, no, this makes no sense. No one's going to understand this. Please give us something much more narrative. I was like, oh, New York Times sucks. So I wrote something else. It did have the word fuckery in it. They did take that out because that is really how basic they are. Also, I need the New York Times. So like, you know, we all need them, but um, they are basic. So then I had this text. It was the beginning of this poem really. And, you know, I, I cannibalized my artwork. Jasmine Wahi told me to do that. And, I might start something, put it away, and years later come back to it and, and, and reimagine it. Um, but I kind of hit the ground running, and whilst I was working on this stuff to do with the home, I began embroidering onto the tea towels. Um, uh, yeah, and then this was the wall that we put together at Fort Gowns Wall, which was my last new solo show. Um, it's a three floor gallery, I took all three floors. And that is, but it's all text from this poem. Uh, my mother, she passed, and um, I felt like I needed in this show to do something with tea. Um, tea was our thing, and it's the way she woke me up. It's the way she trained me to wake her up. It's the way I trained my daughter to wake me up. Um, with a cup of tea and biscuit, by the way, not literally like pouring tea on my feet or anything. And I was thinking a lot about um, that ritual, that very tender ritual, but also about the body and how hers had warped and would talk at the end was almost unrecognizable and how heartbreaking that was and how I wanted to protect her and protect her body. Um, but I was also thinking about grief and trauma as these things that take pieces away from you, that take pieces out of you. Um, but you're still whole and you're still, you know, we can still tell 
what you are and you are a being. Um, so basically, I, I made these teacups that were very much inspired by the textiles I was working with. And then I found myself writing again. The show at Fort Gansport, it, it did really well. I think it was it was the first time that I'd had a show where I was like, wow, so you kind of smashed it in that one. Um, but I would get home from the studio visits, taking these big curators around and all that, and I felt like I was kind of a fraud because I'd made this show and this work that was speaking about violence, but I had left out to protect this person. <laughs> I'd left out my... I, he knew he was in the work and he was in the work, but like I spared him for that show. And when that relationship ended, I was suddenly liberated. And I was like, I think I can actually say what I want. Guess what? Like, and I didn't sign no NDA this time. So, <laughs> so I began to expand the poem. I just wrote, 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 wrote. And I've been working with that text ever since. And now in its entirety, it is part of a 17 minute video installation where it's performed by three women. Um, the pandemic hit and, um, you know, we were all forced indoors and I was, I had this text and I, I wanted to work with the text, but I also, I felt like, this is, this is a little like long-winded, maybe I should circle back to it, but um, I don't know if you can see it, but it says, it's out the way the room had died from left to right and the nostalgic awareness of that split second switch when bravado metamorphosizes into violence before her very eyes, eyes closing now. And a lot of my work I'm realizing is about that moment when something begins to turn. So in that first show, I was looking at the moment when something living begins to die. And here in this work, I was looking at that very familiar moment when you realize that you're in danger, when you're like, oh shit, this isn't just banter, or like you might get big initially um, when you feel confronted. And sometimes that will work and sometimes people will back down, but there is unfortunately a moment for people in smaller bodies or when people are outnumbered where they suddenly realize like, oh, this has switched, this is real, I'm not going to win, I'm in danger. And so I was making work about that. But I was also wanting to look at the home and the female experience as this place of like incredible wilderness. I think because of the pandemic and being cut off from people that I love and my friends and my family, I it actually made my work a little bit more positive, if, that's, if that makes any sense. Basically what I'm saying is I was looking at trauma, but instead of looking at the trauma, I was looking at our resilience, um, was using this text a lot. Maybe I could have been less angry. Maybe I could have been more peaceful with the snake. I mean, we could talk for so long about the snake and the significance and what it means to me, but I don't like want to like chew your ear off. Um, I was working with photographs for the first time since my first show. And um, again, I think because of lockdown and being cut away, cut off, from my women, I, my girlfriends, I was looking back at photographs of us and I was noticing how one thing that I have in common with most women in my life is that A, everyone is a survivor of something and B, everyone can really like throw down and party and, <laughs> and use our slash their bodies in marvelous ways despite <clears throat> illness or rape or grief or heartbreak or what have you um you know, i've had friends who've been hospitalized um and then you know ones who've had like really fucked up experiences with labor or miscarriage and whatnot and yet they put on their game face they go out and they celebrate um so yeah again the snake women texts this was all part of my first show with Pippi Houseworth, which was called Know Me. And Know Me is the name that I gave to the shadow aspect of my psyche, my alter ego. And um, there's all my girls. Um, then Brianna Taylor was murdered. And um, the reason why I've included this in the presentation is because I guess I want to show how um, 
I think we have the ability, particularly now, to be working on our kind of more studio practice work, with long lead projects and series, but then something happens. And if you get the opportunity or you get asked to, or you decide to make something in response to what has just happened, we can almost like switch hats and tap into another part of our creativity. So, you know, each time I've done something before Freedoms, and um, I'm sure Mark, you've had the same experience, they ask you, and you've got like a day, you know, Zoe, do you want to do a billboard? It's for next week. And so you don't have the time to fucking sew something. So I photographed um, those are my bed sheets and um, some bed sheets I had, these sort of 70s bed sheets I had in the studio that I wasn't using. Um, and created something that I'm really proud of. Um, all right, so lastly, I could go 15 minutes left of chit chat. I'm gonna talk about the work I'm making right now. I'm gonna talk about film. So here we are, and I am preparing the next solo show, which is gonna be in London. Um, and it's called Blood Work. And I'm continuing to work with the text. Um, there's, again, where it's a 17 minute poem, there was a hell of a lot that I didn't use. But I think um, you guys will hopefully agree that I'm tapping into a more kind of celebratory, joyful place with my work in terms of colours, in terms of the images, in terms of even the scale, honestly. I mean, these are tiny. Maybe I could have been more quiet. Maybe I won't be so silent. And um, he left with pieces carved from her insides, warped but did not break. That's one of the last lines. Um, maybe I should watch my tone. Maybe I won't be so silent. These are really small works, to be honest. They're not, I don't even know if I'm going to show them in London. I think for sure this one, because I feel like this is, I feel like this is a significant piece of, for what I'm trying to say with this work. Um, looking at, you know, just really expanding the textiles that I collect. They're not just tea towels anymore, they're cushions and they're pillows and they're, you know, throws from all sorts of different eras. And I feel like I'm really starting to, take pleasure in making these works. And for me, these gloves, all of them different and all of them from the home really speak to this idea of how we can bind together and, and, and hold each other and how we do do that. Like, you know, when my mum died, my people came over with food and I do that for everyone I know who's going through something. And I think it's one of the, the best things about um, our cultures. Um, I'm doing these larger embroideries now, <clears throat> also from photographs. So that's that's me, that's my friend Kush, Kush Jumbo, who's in my film. That's my mother with short red hair. That's a student of hers, family friend Claire, and that's my pregnant cousin. Um, and then this one I just finished this weekend. Um, I'm not just looking at women in the celebratory mode. I'm also looking at the opposite. And this is a this is a still from my film. So that brings me lastly to Show Me Your Bruises Then, which is a three-channel video installation. Um, I shot it at my mother's table in London. I got these two incredible actresses, Sienna and Sienna Villa and Chris Jumbo, and I cast a third woman a Chicago actress and when the pandemic hit she was like I'm not leaving Chicago and I was like I completely get it so I went back to Siena and I was like can you help me cast um <laughs> I need the third woman because this actress has dropped out and she was like no <laughs> it's you and I was like no yeah whatever fuck off Siena you know? we're all actresses like you babe. and she was like listen it's your story. This is your language. You are the authentic link between me and Kush because her, her and Kush don't know each other. I'm friends with both of them. And she was like, this, it's like, just try it. If you hate it, you can reshoot your bit. But this, And I think this is what I've experienced quite a lot in my career. And I'm super fortunate for, or super grateful to, which is that 
there have been moments where people have really pushed me to go way outside my comfort zone, way, way, way. Um, so I've never directed anything before. Um, I've certainly never performed anything like formally. Um, and we did this over two days and there are also these moments that I call still lives, but they actually are moving. There's footage of um, tea spilling in slow motion out of the cups. Um, there's a whole thing with milk because there's this language in the poem, it's just a cool glass of milk. So you screw your eyes shut and pretend it's just a cool glass of milk. There's these moments where I'm mopping up the stains with these tea towels and sometimes you'll have one woman speaking on one screen and this is happening on the others um or bruises then which um again i only just color finished the color grade last week so i don't know when and where or how i'm going to get to show this work but hopefully at some point there will be an institution that wants to do it it's super triggering I'm, the only people that I've shown it to so far um have been people that I know who are close to me and there's been like tears and and it's heavy it's like it's heavy shit and because you know you're talking about death you're talking about grief and you're talking about essentially sexual assault as well as periods there's a lot <laughs> and so it really needs to be shown with an institution or gallery I think not gallery no but um a space that is um, open to the task of really creating the best environment possible. Because I think that work about arresting difficult topics is so often disseminated and displayed in this like basic, almost like thoughtless way, which is cool because it's all about the work. But often, you know, we can we can have an experience with art. Um, and then we're just kind of left alone with that. And that's not what I want to do. So, um, yeah, there's conversations that need to be had when the time is right. Um, that is, that's the images. What shall I, shall I come back to here, I guess. Again, um, I don't think, I, you guys are all mad smart, so I don't think I need to draw the parallels to the film and this installation. Oh, but just to say, I showed the film to Jasmine Wahi, who's one of my best friends, and she's this amazing curator. And um, she said to me, I don't like the sound that you have. So I, I had at the very beginning when, I don't know, when it, when it fades up and you see this empty table three times, um, I forget what I had had initially. I had some kind of like sound piece, right? And then you, then the three women come in and then they start talking. And she was like, maybe you should record some real sound. And I was like, hang on a minute. I have the last, my mate, the last meal that I had in my house where my mom is there and we're eating kebabs and you can hear her voice and it's banter, it's jokes. And so the film starts, you've got a black screen and you have, you hear my brother, you hear me go, go on, brother, you're gonna make a speech. And my brother gets up and goes, oh, good meals around this table, blah, blah, blah. And then my mum's cracking jokes about how she couldn't, she can't cook shit because she really couldn't. Um, so it's this nice little moment and then that sound fades away. You have the poem and then at the very end that sound comes back. So it, it's a way of ending actually with my mum. Um, it starts and ends with my mum and it starts and ends at her table. And really it started here 10 years ago. Um, so I guess, yeah, I just mentioned that, um, not to weather the point, but just that I don't think there's um, any harm, even if you've shown a piece, I don't think there's any harm in in picking it apart and taking bits or redoing bits and borrowing them. And, and, and I think, you know, sometimes our, our greatest well and source material is, is the work that we've already made and started. So that's my presentation. So we're going to do some questions. I'm glad you came back around to the video because was when you were talking about it originally, I was going to ask um, how you felt about because originally you said that you um, 
asked uh, some other actors or friends of yours to perform in the video. I was going to ask how you felt about um, being the person that does the writing and then um, sort of letting someone else take it over. And, yeah. Uh, I don't know. It's, it's, I'm glad to hear that you got to that place. I think it's really scary. I've done a little bit in that line. Um, and um, yeah, I think it's a really lovely way to again, sort of take ownership over the words that, mm. that you've labored over. Yeah, thank you. I mean, editing was interesting as well. Luckily, I, I obviously worked with an editor and um, she, I, I, you know, there were obviously moments where I was like, I feel like I can't really make the call about who should say this line. So, um, and I edited myself um, out of a lot of it, the first cut, and then showed it to the producers and they were like, yeah, I think you guys need to go back in. Because at this point, why are you there on screen if you're if you're giving all the lines to Kush and Sienna? And I'm like, because they're professionals. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, that was that was an interesting process. But I have to say, what I realised as well is that the real art happens in the editing, um, like the way that you can change something and and give it entirely different meaning per per the cuts is just yeah really. It was really fascinating to me. You use the word beauty, mm -hmm. perfection, mm -hmm. aesthetism related to women. Mm -hmm. Say women head to aesthetics. Can you say more about that? Yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> I think it's a really complicated um, issue and it's it's something that I think is is a great topic to explore because you know, identifying as a woman being in a woman's body in this world, in this society, we're held to um, completely different standards than our male counterparts, right? And I think we can be very shackled by that. Um, at the same time, there is great pleasure that can be taken. And I, I think in, in the act of, say, beautifying oneself, one's home, um, the create the creativity that we might put into a meal or a gathering or or a celebration or something, and I think that these things that fall under the category of so-called women's work, we need to kind of both do away with with these ideas as being um, things that we have to or should adhere to, but if we choose to, I think it's a space and a terrain that is very rich and we can choose to lean into that as well as women. Um, and I think a lot of it really comes from examining the, the gaze and desire and looking at like, am I doing this for me or am I doing this because I'm, you know, trying to appeal to, to this the male standard and, and make make nice for what they have to look at. Do you know what I mean? So it's fascinating, I think. Yeah, I hope that helps a little bit. Hey. Um, hello, thank you. Hi. Um, I think you're going to get up to the marks that you are about feminism as well. And I'm just wondering what kind of feminism you're trying to impart or what your message is. Mm -hmm. It's not so it, you said it's not a critique, for example. Right. So what what is it? Yeah, I think I think that's a really good question. I don't personally identify as a feminist, so I should probably have no but it's fine. I'm not offended at all. Like I'm not offended at all. I mean, I do and I don't. I I subscribe to intersectional feminism 100 percent um i think that there are massive problems with the feminist movement the history of feminism um that's still very much today like it's not done it's not like we figured that out um and it it really needs it's not just a rebranding it just it like we need to examine these these ideas and, and where they came from and who was centered um, you know, whose voices, what kinds of women were centered in this movement and um, how can we go forward today um, creating something with much more equity and purpose. So, so feminism is a tricky one for me. Um, 
So I, I hope that answers a little, a little bit. Um, intersectionality or intersectional feminism is, is definitely uh, more what I am personally interested in. Yeah, yeah. go for it. Um, do you think, I mean, I guess we look Right. Um, but I'm just wondering if we can have a war. You know, of course, we can create the people who are lovely. And we can uh, um, fight for our rights. But can we do that by also looking beautiful? You know, mm. I mean, that's what I mean. Like, can we do both parts? I don't know. I, I don't think that they want us to, for sure they don't, but I think we have to be authentic. So it has, you know, the fact that like, I like clothes and I like makeup. Sometimes like I just mm, get a new glitter thing, put that shit on and I feel great. I'm like, this has actually brought me pleasure. I have glitter on my face. I've got some stars stuck here, how fun. Um, I find it, you know, the process of, of beautification is often actually a way for me to connect to my London route. Um, and when you're working in your studio, as, as I do, I, I work with things that are kind of like yummy and you want to touch. Um, why should that not, why should I not have that in my personal life when I want to? However, I will tell you this, it is 1000% hurt my career in that I have had to prove myself over and over again and like particularly in the beginning when people were like Zoe who uh, no and and a lot of that is because like I would show up at art events looking fly and they don't want they don't want that like I literally had male artists and male creators being like you know as a female artist you're supposed to be a sexless cat woman like not like a cat woman like oh my god Michelle Pfeiffer but like a, an old woman who owns cats, doesn't like sex, um, and only makes work about trauma and probably has bad breath. I'm like, that's not me. Trauma, yeah. <laughs> but, um, so they don't want it. I hope that, you know, we can start to um, break some of that down for, for artists coming up. I, I feel like Marilyn Minter is, She's wonderful in that way. And there are um, other female artists who are a little more unapologetic about it. Like we all know that if Frida Kahlo existed today, she would want that. She would probably have her own filter on Instagram. Because if you look at her work, she would, she would edit herself in her paintings. She would cinch her own waist and shit like that. I was like, Sis was doing her own filter and she, the pleasure she took in adorning her hair, her body, all of that. Like, if she was an artist today, curators, galleries, they would probably hate her. They'd probably be like, no, 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 you're, no, you're not supposed to enjoy beauty. You're not supposed to enjoy beauty. So, you know, fuck that. Thank you. <laughs> you're welcome. Um, I had another question about um, the way that you were talking about uh, photography and um, installation work and then you went into the embroidery and you're working a lot and it seems like mostly with text mm. um, and in the newer works you're um i don't know if you call it drawing you're embroidering but like you're using these images of like you said your cousin who's pregnant and your mom and yeah. things. um do you have how has that shift been for you i feel like um, um those feelings and um i don't know yeah i'm just curious what sort of prompted that shift from working um, with the text to sort of drawing and imagery? Yeah, I think, um, so like with Every Curve, which was that show that I had in LA, I, I didn't want, I didn't know how as an artist, I could make work that was about objectification, essentially an agency, right? And, and also use the female form. I hadn't used the female form or actually any form like animals or women um, until uh, Know Me, the show that I started in 2020. Um, and I, I didn't know how to put a woman's body um, on behind glass or on a pedestal without contributing to the things that I have a problem with. And I think a lot of it was about 
I don't know, sitting with that conundrum, as it were, and like ruminating on it. Like I, I would work with things that we sit on, we wear, something that's inside our body. Um, again, things that we have kept close and precious to us, like wedding dresses and whatnot, things we click on, sleep on, blah, 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 blah. Then when the pandemic hit, and again, we were all forced inside, I, I felt like, I don't know if I was conscious of it, but I was missing bodies. There weren't bodies in our lives. I was alone. I had a then eight-year-old to take care of half of the time because half the time she's with her dad. And so I spent a lot of time completely isolated. Um, and so I don't think it's an accident that it was at that moment really that I started to put the bodies literally into the work and um, again starting with photography and then embroidery I don't know maybe if I'd gone to a better art school like this one <laughs> um, maybe I would have learned this earlier but I scale and the body is is um, a complicated terrain like how much space women take up like I started off little bodies <laughs> And now I'm I'm literally only just starting to to make them bigger and and take up more of the so-called canvas. Um, and it's it's something that yeah I'll be playing around with for a while. I think. Oh, yeah. Yes. Um, thank you so much for presenting. Oh, uh, I really really enjoy your use of language, and I really am so like disappointed. <laughs> I do not accept that. I think that it was very obvious what was going on. I mean, I know you were saying that, that but that kind of leads to my question. Um, I'm engaging more and more in my own work based on with uh, actual written words mm. heard in my own personal poetry. And I find I'm trying to avoid it this longer. No, different. I find like a lot of pleasure in abstracting the language more than I do in in, in the literal like being literal. Yeah. Like that's it, it inspires me more. Yeah. It inspires my vision. And I guess I just wonder what your experience with your viewers, you know the ones that I guess you conversated with others too, how they reflect on your use of language and how personally your like engagement with your own poetry, mm. the use of your work has been. Yeah, I think um, one of the ways to really explore that um, that I, I think and hope is successful with the video piece is that because it's on three channels, it's not and and the beginning of it certainly like even if you saw it written on a page, it's like. I told him I could get women to inflict the pain elsewhere. You're walking fine to me. Like, it's just, it doesn't really make much sense to begin with. And then it kind of settles in and goes into, um, into depicting, I guess, um, one particular experience. But because of having three women, I was able to have, like, play around with sometimes all three women say the same thing um speak at the same time but actually like I can fuck with that so that they're not it's not in sync like first of all if you get three women to say show me your bruises then they're all going to say it in a different way right and I definitely wasn't that kind of director to give line reading shit so um the result I think is really successful in that I got to abstract the language so much in the edit like, again, like I said, sometimes you don't know which two are speaking. And and if you, if you can, and you can work with confusion as well. Like, I think for a lot of people who experience um, violence, there's, it, it literally makes your mind splutter into infinite pieces. And you start like recording things that were happening in that moment. And that's how your brain works, right? You go into fight, flight freeze and your brain takes these snapshots so that if you smell that thing if you see that thing if you hear that song you're protected 
because you know to run, fight, fight, or freeze. Um, and so there's this splintering. And then, of course, you know, with a lot of cases of um, intimate violence and domestic violence, there is often alcohol. Um, for me, there was alcohol and Xanax. And so in the language and in the, in the edit, I got to confuse the viewer even more so that um, to kind of speak to that experience of, um, of trauma, A. And B, I've had people look at the film and where you've got the three women, they're like, so is that she's who you wish you were in that moment or he, she's who one wishes they had been in that moment? She's who you really were and she's your inner da 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 And I'm like, well, no, not really, but yes, <laughs> that's brilliant. Um, but it feels that way, you know? Like, what is reality? And that's why, um, you know, we're all sad in the same spot at the table because that, that was obviously a choice like I could have had Kush in the middle and me to the side and I'm in profile Sienna's on the other side and she's in profile you're like okay you feel as a viewer that you're sat with three women around the table but yeah I wanted I wanted it to be an, a, an unrealistic space it's, it's not literal you don't know if it's a dream or, or what the fuck do you feel it the same way about that spoken language as you do in terms of your language like we're instancing your tea towels because your tea towels were a lot more than were your own poetry right yes and your own right yeah and then before that you had like a lot of appropriated yeah was that similar to in the video or how did that work? no i would say um so with the tea towels they're only little bits like there's no, there isn't, this is the only place where the text exists in its entirety. Um, so the tea towels are, are, are very much just little moments. And the way that I present the text on the tea towels is a lot more basic and literal, essentially. Um, and I think that's also because I guess you're imagine, or I imagine things in terms of the shows. Um, and so presenting that wall where you got, like, I, I wanted it to be overwhelming. I wanted people to get up to the third floor, the top floor, and be like, oh, okay, I'm gonna take a seat and read some of this stuff because it's, it's, it's so much and it's kind of like truncated um, the sentences. And, you know, some of them are like, da -da -da -da, kind of in around, and some of them are working with stains and whatnot. Um, but yeah, I don't know if that answers your question, but I guess I guess what I'm trying to say is that when it came to the embroideries, I don't think I was abstracting the text much at all. Um, but for the selection process and the curation of it, because oh, I'm trying to, it's just a cool glass of milk. Sorry. It's just a cool glass of milk is that big one and the one next to it that almost has this sort of almost like Moroccan looking cloud sort of shapes. That one just says idiot, 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 idiot over again. Um, so I think you can make choices um, with like fucking with things and abstracting them and confusing things in the way that you display them. Unfortunately, you know, someone owns that piece and all they own is idiot, 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 idiot. But you know, that was their choice. I was actually thinking getting up a piece of the one. Yes. Um, so I'm interested in how like art can be like art therapy. Uh, but then when you get yourself into conversation, you might find that like people are trying to undermine the sincerity of a practice. Um, in your work, I find like these awesome like uh, significance of like opportunity to see that someone could attack that word. Mm. Um, when you said use the non-disclosure agreements. Um, can you speak on like how that has like provided to conversations that you hold in your practice? Yeah, I think that when someone, when you're not, I think if I'm understanding your question correctly, um, when you are, when one is not allowed to speak about something, it just actually forces you to be a better artist. Do you know what I mean? So I made this show 
and there was only one, sorry, not that one, I made that show and there was only one writer who picked up on what it was really about for me, um, Seth, Seth Rodney from Hyperlegic. <laughs> I met up with him afterwards and I was like, you were the only one who got what that work was about. People luckily liked the work and they wrote really interesting things about it. And that I wasn't examining job keeps, but I think that it gives you an opportunity to go, okay, so I'm going to find another way to say what I'm going to say because you can't. We're not going to be silent, obviously. We just have to be clever sometimes. Does that answer your question at all? Okay, cool. Hey. Um, I was wondering, um, what is the moment that you make the art? Like, that you think you make the art? Because I know that you were saying something about the space, that there's this moment where the space becomes small and you become, and you're like, you're, that's the moment where you're like, actually, Fighting. Yeah. So I wonder if that's kind of that moment where you're also creating hardware and you can Yeah, it's a good question. Thank you. Um, I think that what I've realized is that a lot of my decisions, and again, like we realize these things in, in hindsight, but um they are about control for me. I didn't like the process of you do this thing, whether it's digital or film, and then it goes someplace else, right? And you fucking hand your like negatives off to like, my whole time at school. The only time I felt that I was in control was when I was in the dark room. And like, oh, I don't know. I, was, I, didn't, I don't know. It just didn't feel to me like it was a discipline that allowed me to really take control. And I think with, oh, and then obviously a photograph, you know, for the most part is printed and framed and hung and then it goes away. Maybe it comes back to your studio, maybe it goes elsewhere. But I really, it was important to me that I had something that I could hold in my hands. And that if there was a mistake that was made, I knew instantly because everyone at school was like, accidentally particularly towards the end when it came to the show and whatnot they the fuck ups were epic like they would um accidentally lose their entire hard drive or they would have the the card in the fucking film in the digital camera and then they lost it or they spilled coffee on it and i'm like no my i do not have the tools for anxiety for this like no like i want my shit in front of me if i spill on it you know what that's a nice stain. I'm going to work with that. If I make a mistake, so we're going to just cut that, unpick it, start again. Um, and I think, again, not to work at the point, but I think that this has a lot to do with the neighbourhood and the environment that I grew up in, in that um, we just felt unsafe all the time. Like, growing up, we were broken into and robbed my house, like, maybe five, six times. So it was a very nostalgic meal that kebabs around the table but it was also like shit Michael my brother who made the speech I was like do you remember when that guy climbed in through your window while you were sleeping like can you imagine being a child and waking up to someone coming in through your window and you're like fuck and they're like fuck like it was it was rough and we would have crackheads knocking on the door and all sorts of things and then like the shit that would happen to girls oof, and guys um every single guy that I knew going up Every single one um, got mugged at some point. And like, it was just like standard. Like, you know, I've got new trainers, got mugged, don't have my new trainers anymore. Um, but so in my artistic practice, places where I can take ownership became very important to me. And then when my mum was sick, I, so again, I've been constructing those gloves, right, for uh, Let Her Rain, sorry. And then, so then this work, I need, needed slash need a studio for this work. Like, they're big quilts. I work with a neon person to make my neons. The clusters, as you know, obviously I have to have, like, to make, to make that one, I have to have 20 boxing gloves and then a whole fucking load of wedding dresses and veils and cut them up and pin them up and then 
Jane wedding dress lady finishes them and then come back and I put them on these chains. I need a studio for that. That year, the terminal diagnosis, and I was by her side for a lot of it. And I needed, it made sense that I returned back to hand embroidery from this to that because I could put that in my bag, get on a flight, I could sit on her bed, give her her morphine, she's chilling out, I'm sewing. She helped me title that piece and she ironed it for me as well. It was very important to her that she was like, I can still iron. Um, so I think, you know, sometimes our artistic practices, we're not even aware of the choices, but they adapt her our life circumstances and, and the fuckery shit that happens or the great the great shit that happens. I really look forward to like really great shit happening and then what that will do to my artistic practice. Fun, isn't it? I think I'm I think I'm due that. <laughs> and then she was happy and everything was good and then she just made work of sunrises. Um any other questions? Yes. Um, so for the, it was like the, the ovary piece with the, the blouse and the white. Yes. Um, so that was in the gallery and then someone wanted it for, for installation. Yes. I'm really hoping that there's like a little nugget in your head, like thinking about like, um, like social um, site specific pieces in the future. Yeah. Well, oh, I wish I had stuck in here. Okay, so no, because it's a rendering. Okay, so basically many years ago, I, I had this idea for something and I paid this guy a thousand dollars to make these renderings and they're beautiful. And I showed it to some curators and they were like, it's brilliant, it's funny, absolutely not. Um, we're not gonna do it because it was a um, a playground, this huge playground of these powder-coated metal um, apparatuses that kids and anyone can can slide down, swing on, blah, blah. But they are essentially giant surgical gynecological instruments. So the speculum, so fucking, it was, I thought it was genius. So the, the speculum is a slide, you know, the speculum, crank. So you, you climb up the steps at the back of it and you slide down it and um, it's like, you know, yummy, Jeff Coombsy kind of red. And then um, there's a seesaw um, made from the like scissor-like, um, elongated scissor-like things used in biopsies and whatnot. And then there's, side wall four sets which has become a swing set so i put together this installation all these these renderings all these new york people were like no 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 i was like okay i forgot about it years passed texas abortion van a the chief curator of a museum in dallas got in touch with me at the end of last year and she was like zoe um I saw your renderings way back when, and I just wanted to know if you'd like to bring this project into fruition. So hopefully if we get through the red tape, um, cause I'm sure you know there's board and there's directors and whatnot. And if we get through the red tape, then I'll get to um, do my playground, which will definitely be site specific. And, and yeah, I, I think really important today in somewhere like Texas. So we'll see you pray for me. Hi. I want to ask when you are creating uh, what kind of audience will you make you will make you imagine making about that? That's a good question. I never ever 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 think about that. Because I think that um I think it's a it's almost like a daily practice of of closing off um what viewers might want and expect or even need because if I think for me personally if I think about that I'll just get I'll go down a whole rabbit hole and that will ultimately negatively impact my artistic practice and the same goes for um, thinking about writers and definitely thinking about collectors so I actually not every time 
But um, I, I have a, a practice in my studio before I start work that involves, um, I have on a personal level, a, stu- a um, spiritual practice and I have a home altar in, in my studio, which is my home, by the way, I make work in my living room. So what that means is that I can go to my altar before I start work and I can do some kind of invocation or some kind of offering, which just humbles me and and takes myself as the creator out of it I guess this is quite esoteric but um if you are someone that believes in or has a relationship to an idea of the divine or God then starting the day with an offering to the divine is a way you can do it with food you know offer your food or or whatever but I, I do it before I start work as well because it's a way of being like anything that happens today in my studio that didn't even come from me that came from y'all and I think that um it's just a really good practice but also what that does is it makes it makes the process of making art much less focused on the outcome because we can't control the outcome and if we start to try and get into that headspace I think we'll go mad in a bad way so there's good crazy and there's bad crazy and um yeah so I don't think about the audience I it's always um super moving and flattering when people tell me that they feel seen or represented within the work or they see experiences that they've had um explored and they that that feels I I like that feeling but I'm not making work for them if that makes any sense yeah that's surprising to me because I've always felt like your work communicates in such a subtle and yet Away. Thank you. I think that's a compliment. I like it. Yeah, yeah, that is. Thank you. Can I ask a really specific question? Yes. It's about the first of the snake pieces that you showed us that you made for Yeah. Um, and there are these patterns. Look like they kind of like florets. Mm-hmm. I'm really curious about them because these these abstract decorative uh, patterns appear in, in in much of your work, but not all. What can you tell a little bit about where those patterns come from? Are they of your own invention? Are they specific references? Yeah. So these, I've I've really tried to get more of them. Um, they're called Nanduki lace. And um, they are vintage. I guess they're kind. Of, I call them doilies or like, but really the size of these ones they're kind of almost coasters actually. Um, and so I, I had a lot of fun collecting from different um, parts of the world and different eras their domestic textiles. Um, and then you know it's. I, thank you for this question because I I didn't really go into it whilst I was presenting because I thought it would almost be like overkill or too much but um I still I guess um every now and again do a modality of therapy called EMDR um I don't know if you guys have ever yeah yeah so it's about the brain and it's a particularly used for trauma can be used for grief as well um and it stands for eye movement desensitization reprocessing fuck what it means the the practice involves stimulating your right and left cortexes of your brain alternately so that um you think of a difficult thing difficult memory something that might trigger you and work with somebody who, when you think about that and you're breathing and blah, 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 they're finding a way of making your brain go left, right, left, right, left, right, because trauma is stuck in the center of the brain and we need to metabolize it. We need to move it. And the best, most effective way of moving it is by EMDR left. So I was making this work, I was doing EMDR and this is, this is like one of the instances and, and I was knitting the two halves together in certain pieces. Sometimes I would work with just just one uh, doily. But um, yeah, this was very much about EMDR, but also I said I wouldn't chew your ears off about the snakes, but the um, when when 
going down this journey of EMDR and this woman's explaining to me about the left and the right. I'm like, oh yeah, I know about that because Kundalini yoga. And she's like, no, it's like actually medical. And I was like, no, you don't understand. They've been doing this in India for like thousands of years ago. And so Kundalini is about accessing this sort of snake-like energy through breath that runs, they say, down the center of your body. And the two, there's two snakes that represent your left brain and your right brain, and they curve and intersect um, at the chakra points. It's breathing techniques to access left and right because the health and mental benefits of using the left and right in an alternate way of your brain is like amazing. So that's the snake. And also, you know, as we know, the snake represents um, sin and, you know, all of that shit. <laughs> Have you had an experience with Kundalini energy rising? You what? Yeah. Yeah. Love accessing the Kundalini snake. <laughs> have you? I have, but really, I don't think. But I've heard people talk about it. I mean, I've practiced a little Kundalini yoga, but um, I've heard about people on extended retreats. Oh, that's okay. I think I should sign up for one of those. But breath work is just. So powerful, some of the shit that you can do with reference. It's the same, man. Um, were there any questions coming in the chat? Um, the questions, some of the questions that came up in the chat kind of got answered already. Um, Miss Ellen Carpenter asked a question that was essentially the question that I asked you earlier. Um, and, you know, how um, all the follow is about the figure as it appears in your work. A lot of the work you showed is connected to the figure and the body, but it is not a literal representation of the figure. What made you decide to turn to film and use people in the work mm. with direct representations of figures on the screen? Yeah, yeah. Um, well, I did sort of answer that, but also when it comes to the film, um, I, I think having the, the pieces of embroidery where the text was all broken up, it was actually a, a curator was walking through my show at Fort Gansport. Um, and he was like, so, like, your mum was a writer, right? And I said, yeah. And he was like, and you, like, grew up in the theatre? And I said, yeah. And I kind of knew where he was going with it. And I didn't want him to ask me this because I didn't want to be pushed outside of my comfort zone. But he was like, obviously, this piece of text over here kind of rhymes with that one over there. Or, like, they're sort of about the same thing. And I'm like, yeah, no, because it's from a piece of writing. Like, it's from there is a piece of writing. Then it gets splattered and splintered into all these different pieces. And he was like, have you ever thought about bringing it back together just for a performance? He was like, because I would love to see how that impacts this work, contrast this work, build upon this work, or how this work builds upon that. Um, and so, yeah, it was, he, he you know, put, gave me the, the idea and then it was just a process of really just sitting with it and getting the confidence to make it happen. Yeah, but my hope is that um, when I present the film and the way that I'm pitching it right now is that you would walk into a room in an adjacent gallery, you would see the works that have informed it or vice versa. Um, and my hope is that you'll see how um, they, the conversation is just widened. And I, I think also the film's really hard, like it's, it's not necessarily a pleasant experience. And I think that art can offer you a way to almost reprocess that, right? So like if you go and you watch the film and then you come out, we're still working with the film, we're still working with the text, we're still working with things that are explored in the film, but now you've got color, you've got space, you can walk around, you can breathe, you can walk around a piece, you can go to this wall over here, you can just say, fuck it, I don't wanna see any of this stuff, I'm walking out, whatever, you have the freedom, but, the show of the physical works that go with the film, I think needs to be joyful and needs to be speaking to our resilience because that, and that brings us back to our good friend Hank, um, you know, a lot of what, where I've gotten to with my work um, is this idea of, of joy as radical protest in a way. Um, because I think, oh, maybe I'll end it here. I think that, 
Oh, we have one more. Okay. All right. Well, I'll just say this anyway, but I do think at the risk of sounding like a fucking soul sniper instructor, <laughs> I do think that um, at us being okay, everyone in this room, like you being okay is your greatest revenge for the shit that you've gone through. I really, truly like, and if, and if we can put time and space into being okay, that's how we win. Um, question. <laughs> thank you for that. Yeah, this last question just goes along with that. I would say, um, Misha asks, uh, thank you for sharing your, uh, your story that contains uh, compl complicated matters. I've experienced um, some of the triggers that you mentioned. Um, and uh, let's see. Um, and uh, she, uh, she uh, identifies with um, your justify your need to justify your interest in fashion and beauty. These struggles also provide content for your work. What advice would you give to a visual artist or painter that travels with some of your themes? Mm, thank you. Thank, thank you for your question. Um, I think that we have to bring it back to authenticity and being authentically you. Um, I guess I struggle with the term unapologetic because I, I'm not personally trying to be unapologetic and I don't think that that's the answer. Um, I think we learn from being open and listening and, and, and having people call us out or call us in or however, whatever, you know, helping us evolve essentially. Like I've benefited so much from people in my community and, and friends taking time to help me evolve. Um, and so I don't think it's like be unapologetically you. I think it's actually just be authentically you. And I think just, yeah, keep focused on, on your natural qualities and abilities because ultimately we all come into this world with our own little bit of flavour and, um, and we should be doubling down on what that is. Um, but wait, there was something that something else that she said. Oh, I just want to say as well, because um, it occurred to me that I think that I've benefited in my career a lot from um, community. And I think that there's this culture in in art school when you guys, this is MFA, isn't it? Like that's, the, that's big shit. And I, I don't know if, if there is a culture in your course of like, tearing each other down um but i will say that like you're sat amongst like the sickest people like in this room here on zoom like you are going to change the art world and you're going to help each other and so it's actually really beneficial to be kind um to each other because where lots of you are going to go out and make incredible work some of you are going to go out I imagine statistically and maybe become curators gallerists writers directors of institutions and it happens I don't think people expect it to happen when they're in a program but like my best friend um in New York we went to school together she instantly the minute we left art school she was like, eh, I don't want to make work. And she was good. She is good. She's a good artist. Instead, she, she curated. She has a fucking hotel mm, in Rockaway. And she's on the board of this, that, and the other. And she's smashing it. And she just received an autobiography. I guess what I'm saying is, when she's designing her collection for the Rockaway Hotel, hello, I'm already her best friend. Mm. And we met in art school. So you are amongst like the people who are going to change shit and you're contributing to that. And so just, I think community, community, community all the way. And then just lastly, one of the best things about people at the top of their game is that they will be fired. And that's awesome. So I guess what I mean is, like, I am very happy that the museum directors, all of them right now, it's only a matter of time because that's the nature of it. There's nowhere else you can go. You can't go further higher. You will just be replaced eventually. But if you have a relationship with the assistant curator, if you have a relationship with the person who was installing the work, the person who, who came in to, like, do the interview, and they're really just 
fresh out of school and they're doing the interview for the show to go on the wall text or whatever, that person is going to be, is going to climb up. So like, it really does pay to just be open to all of the wonderful people around you, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, guys. Thanks, everyone on Zoom.